Okay, so I got a couple of things to talk about today. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and Rift Tracks Live Sharknado. Uh, I know a couple of you have been asking about this on Twitter or through email or whatever. Um, and I was actually planning on doing a Dawn of the Planet of the Apes vlog on Monday, but I just did not get enough sleep on Sunday night, and I, it, throughout Monday, I just felt like absolute shit. I'm like, no, I'm not recording this today. It's going to be terrible. So, and then on Tuesday, I couldn't do it because that's when I went to see Rift Tracks live. Uh, wanted to see the original showing on uh, Thursday, but... I was going with a couple of friends of mine, and they weren't available that day, but they were available yesterday. So I said, okay, I can wait for the replay. That's fine. So I apologize for the delay. If this has caused you any inconvenience, you will all be compensated with an extra hour in the ball pit. Is that joke old yet? Probably is. Nah, fuck it. So uh, let's talk about Dawn first. Uh... Definitely was looking forward to this one, especially since it was getting unusually high marks from the critics. I was surprised. Um, I mean, I, I saw Rise of the Planet of the Apes a couple of years ago, and that did not get nearly as much praise as this movie got. Although I did like Rise of the Planet of the Apes. It wasn't perfect by any means, but one of its biggest problems was all the Planet of the Apes references that they kept trying to jam into the movie. Some of them worked pretty well. Like, there was a scene where... Caesar is playing with a little toy of the Statue of Liberty. They, that that kind of stuff, very subtle, that worked. When uh, Tom Felton is yelling, It's a madhouse! A madhouse! That, not so much. Also, he needs to work on his American accent. But anyway. Uh, but yeah, I, I did like the movie, so I figured, how bad could this possibly be? And, you know, now that I've seen it, I can see why the critics are raving about this, because this is really really good. Uh, I, I was still kind of surprised with just how good this is, but yeah, it's excellent. Uh, takes place about 10 years after Rise, uh, still set in the San Francisco area. Uh, it's now a post-apocalyptic setting because if, if you saw Rise of the Planet of the Apes, at the very end they mentioned a virus outbreak that was spreading ac across the globe, and that ended up wiping out most of the Earth's population, and there are just pockets of humans here and there still trying to survive. And there's a group of people in the, uh, in what's left of San Francisco, which, uh, certainly has not done well in the last 10 years, but, uh, although depending on what part of the city you live in, in some cases it might be an improvement. But I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm just kidding, kind of. And, um, and meanwhile the apes, are living quite happily up in the Redwood Forest on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge and are doing quite well for themselves. And at some point, uh, the humans decide they're getting tired of barely eking out an existence and they're desperately trying to prevent themselves from going all the way back into the Stone Age and... Like, so up to this point, most of their electricity has come from diesel generators, and they're running out of fuel. But there happens to be a hydroelectric power station nearby. Unfortunately, it's up in ape territory. So they have to work out a deal with the apes where they will be allowed to go up there and get the generator working again so they can all have power. And, of course, it all goes horribly, horribly wrong. And lots of people die on both sides. Lots of man against ape, lots of man against man, lots of ape against ape. Everybody killing everybody. Oh, happy days. Very good story overall. Uh, very well paced, kept the suspense going through pretty much the entire thing. Uh, not a whole lot of downtime, really. It does. There really aren't any points where it drags. It was just very well told. Uh, as far as the, uh, the visuals, looks fantastic. Uh, the, the Redwood Forest where the apes are living and their civilization all looks incredible. Uh, even, even in the scenes that take place at night, I can still actually make out everything that's going on. It's just very well shot. Uh, the post-apocalyptic San Francisco, also very well done. And, you know, it looks pretty authentic for the most part. Um, 
you know, and I'm, I'm sitting in a theater in San Jose watching this. And of course, you know, while they're showing shots of it, I can hear people with, behind me whispering, oh, that looks like Chinatown. And, and it did. It's, you know, they, they did a really good job with there. There were a couple of things that looked a bit off. Uh, and I know 99% of the people who see this movie are not going to care because they're not going to pick up on this. The only reason I do is because I live here. So I notice these things. But just as an example, there's a scene where one of the human characters walks into a BART station, which is Bay Area Rapid Transit. It's one of our train systems here. And he enters the BART station on street level. Like, walks through a door on street level, and there's a turnstile right on the other side of the door, and that is not how the BART stations look in San Francisco. For one thing, they're all underground, because the, the train system is all a subway in the city, and so the, the entrances are staircases. There are no doors to the stations on street level. It's all staircases and elevators and escalators and whatnot. And there also aren't any turnstiles. There are gates. So, and this is nitpicking, I admit, but I'm going to notice these things. But I, I will give them credit for at least getting the actual BART logo and putting that above the door to try to make it look authentic instead of just putting up some generic subway sign. You know, I'll give them credit for that. You know, even though this does not look 100% authentic, it's not like they didn't put any effort into trying to make this look like San Francisco. Clearly, they did, and I give them credit for that. They did a pretty good job with that overall. Obviously, there's a lot of CGI in this movie, of course, because with, with all these ape effects, you kind of have to do it with CGI, um, unless you go the old school route for the, like, the very first movies. But fortunately, it's all done by Weta Digital, and... They have not lost their touch at all. It's, there are a few things here and there that don't quite look right compared to most of the movie, but it, it looks good where it counts. The apes look incredible. And just, you know, the sheer sight of all of them. I mean, you've all seen that scene in the trailer, which is actually how this, the movie opens up, which, with Caesar standing there with the war paint, surrounded by all of his comrades as they get ready for a hunt. You know, just, and even the close-up shots of just the fur and the scars on their faces. And the, this one ape in particular, whose name is Koba, who is like one of Caesar's closest allies, basically. At least at the start of the movie. They butt heads quite a few times throughout the movie because Koba's a bit of a hothead. But just the look of that guy with his horribly scarred face and his one good eye, it just, it, it all looks so very good. And, and the... The ruins of San Francisco are also very well done. It's, it just all looks incredible. Uh, and also, I want to give credit for the musical score because it sounds very, very exciting. Uh, very strong, very percussive in parts, especially in one of the early scenes when the apes are all, you know, making a show of strength to the humans and marching into San Francisco, some of them on horseback, just, you know, showing the size of their force and let, letting them all know they are not to be fucked with. And does it, it almost, that scene in particular, the way the music hit, it almost reminded me of a couple of scenes in Star Wars, really. Uh, the whole thing sounds kind of John Williams-esque. And really, if you want to emulate a guy, you could do worse. <laughs> you really could. The ape characters in this movie are really the stars of the show. This is, I mean, there are human characters in there, but clearly they did not put the emphasis on them. It's, it, Caesar is the main character in this movie, and, he, and he's completely digital. Uh, I mean, obviously it's Andy Serkis there doing motion capture, and, you know, he does a fine job. If you ever need a strong motion caption character, then, we yeah, motion caption? Motion capture, I speak good. Uh, but yeah, uh, Andy Serkis is clearly the guy to go to, and he still does a fantastic job, and Weta Digital did a great job drawing over him. It's, you know, it all looks great. And, yeah, just, you know, watching the scenes that take place in the Ape Village, most of which are completely silent. I mean, there, there's, of course, ambient noise, whatever, but not a whole lot of speech, because some of the apes have developed a at least a rudimentary speech, but a lot of them still have to communicate using sign language, so a good chunk of it is subtitled. And, you know, for, for a lot of 
moviegoers, I can imagine that wouldn't work, just having to sit there in silence and watch, just reading subtitles while, you know, a bunch of monkeys are just waving their hands around. But you know what? It works. And it, it works incredibly well. It really does. Really, the human characters are this movie's one weakness because, for the most part, there's not much interesting about them. I mean, there's a... Uh, Gary Oldman plays kind of the head of the uh, the San Francisco colony, and it, he does a great job with what he's given. Um, unfortunately, he's not in very much of the movie, and I wish he was in more of it because he, he did do a very good job when he was on camera. Uh, there's a, a very powerful scene that he's in when they... Um, at some point, they do, of course, get the generator working, at least for a little while, and they finally get power, and then Gary's just standing there, and suddenly hears a, an iPad beep, that, and, and turns around, picks up his iPad, and just kind of starts going through old family photos and old photos of his military buddies, and it's just extremely well played by him, and I kind of wish there was more of that in here, because for the most part, the humans are just kind of there to keep the story moving. Uh, like, I mean, the, the actors, like Jason Clark and Carrie Russell, uh, Cody Smith-McPhee, who play the, uh, the, uh, the husband and wife and the son, who are part of the team that has to get this generator working, you know, they do a, an okay job with what they're given. They just aren't really given much of anything. They just, they don't have much in the way of personality, except that they're the good guys. That's really it. They're just, you know, they're, they're there to keep the story moving. And really the only one who gets to actually show any kind of personality at all is uh, Kirk Acevedo. I have trouble saying his name for some reason, who plays this guy named Carver, who is basically there just to be the asshole and to give the humans and the apes a reason to be in conflict, because that's really all he does. He just keeps doing shit to piss the apes off. That's pretty much the first thing he does as soon as he shows up on screen, when they're wandering in the woods looking for the generator, and they accidentally stumble upon a couple of apes. So what does he do? He shoots one of them. Yeah, brilliant. Way to keep it in control there, guy. And, of course, they have to keep him in the group even after he's made an ass out of himself because, well, he's the only one who knows how the generator works. And it's a lame-ass excuse. It really is. Like, oh, he's the only one who knows how it works. Okay, well, let's see. I, let's see. I think we have a couple of options here. Um, option A, we could just have him teach us how it works, maybe draw up a diagram of what the control panel would generally look like and what buttons are supposed to do what, what we need to look out for, what we need to pay attention to, and stuff. And, you know, if we have to consult him, the city's just on the other side of the bridge, we'll just drive back and ask him real quick and then come back and get on with our work. Or option two, we can just take him with us and hope he doesn't do something stupid. Again. Let's go with option two. No. No, no. Also got to give credit for the fight scenes, even though they are, again, mostly CGI because they mostly involve apes. Sometimes it's apes fighting humans, sometimes it's apes fighting apes. But it all looks fantastic. Uh, can't really comment on the 3D because I saw it in 2D. Just going on what I've heard, it's not worth a 3D surcharge, which surprises me in a way because this was supposedly, unless I got some bad information, I think this was actually shot in 3D, but I don't know. It was directed by Matt Reeves. Maybe Reeves just hasn't really learned how to make a 3D movie and hasn't figured out how to properly use the 3D camera to the greatest effect. I don't know, but... Yep, for what it's worth, it did look great in 2D. Uh, and yeah, overall, I would definitely recommend seeing this movie if you haven't seen it already. It's, you know, like I said, the human characters are a bit of a letdown, but that's really the only complaint I have. That's, the rest of it is outstanding and definitely well worth seeing. Uh, and while I did like Rise of the Planet of the Apes, this is better in pretty much every way. If you have not seen Rise... 
I, I would recommend you see it because it is still a pretty good movie, but you don't have to. They, it, there's a little montage right at the beginning of the movie that brings you up to speed pretty quick. So if you didn't see Rise, you're not missing anything you absolutely need to see. So now I guess we can move on to Rift Tracks Live Sharknado, which I've also been looking forward to. Uh, and I, I brought a couple of friends along with me who have not seen Sharknado before. And so they, they, I think, had a bit of an idea of what to expect, but I don't think they were fully prepared for just how ridiculous it was going to be. Um, obviously, I had seen it before. I did an entire video on it, so I knew what to expect, and I was kind of looking forward to seeing what jokes they would come up with and if they would, you know, go to any of the same jokes that I made in my own review. And there were a couple of times when they did. There, there was a Duck Hunt reference in there, because that's obvious. There, there was a moment where they're singing It's Raining Sharks. Again, it, it's all obvious, but, but, but still, a lot of really, really funny moments in there. Some of the humor just comes from how ridiculous the movie is on its own. Like the scene where Ian Ziering just, you know, chainsaws that shark in half as it's flying towards him. You know, you, you can't see that and just not, and not laugh at how batshit insane moments like these are. And, you know, I, I think that's why this movie became such a cultural phenomenon, because it, it's a stupid movie. It is a completely stupid movie, but, you know, it knows it's stupid and it embraces it. But at the same time, it's still played out like it's a... It's not played like a serious movie, but the people working on it are taking it seriously, even though they know it's not. Like, it, it's all, all... All of the actors are completely playing it straight. There's no winking at the camera or anything like that. And I think that just adds to the absurdity of it all, that they're in this situation and saying all this ridiculous dialogue and and yet they are they are acting like they're in just a normal movie <laughs> and and it it doesn't hurt that the actors in the movie are actually at least okay i mean even for tara reed this is probably one of her better performances but uh i know that's not saying much but you know and of course they did make fun of tara reed's acting at times throughout the movie and and some of the other actors as well but and and some of the various amounts of stock footage that seem to contradict with the location they're supposed to be at and you know oh it's a sharknado and there's a hurricane wait what you know, but, you know, they, they had fun with it. I had a lot of fun with it, and a good time was had by all. And I know a lot of people were questioning why they would even do a movie like this that is already aware that it's a joke, because, you know, a lot of the best bad movies are made with the intentions of actually put it, uh, producing a good movie. You know, like... Uh, you know, so something made by Ed Wood, for example. Plan 9 from Outer Space. Ed Wood did not set out to make a stupid movie. He was genuinely trying to make a good science fiction movie. And it's, it was the accidental failure there that made it funny. Uh, the Happening is another good example of that. Uh, After Earth. <laughs> uh, a lot of stuff by Shyamalan, really. But, yeah, but whereas Sharknado is very self-aware and... You know, making fun of Sharknado is almost like, almost like doing a parody of Gangnam Style, really. It's already a joke. You know, you're making a joke based on a joke. It's like, it doesn't really work. But, you know, I can kind of see why some people would think this would be pointless. But honestly, as long as you can keep it funny, who cares? You know, it's, it, it's not pointless as long as you can get some good material out of it. And they did. And, you know, I, I do think that as much as they made fun of this movie, I, I do think that they enjoy it just as much as the audience does. And, you know, they, even though they acknowledge it's a stupid movie, they can still have fun with it. If you did not get to see the live show, I'm sure it will end up as either a, a video on demand or a DVD or possibly both. Because I imagine the rights for something like that for an Asylum movie cannot be that expensive. The movie itself only cost, I think, a million and a half. Which, for an Asylum movie, is actually on the expensive end. But, um, or, although that may just be inflation, I don't know. But, 
yeah, if they do put out a VOD or a DVD or whatever, I do recommend picking it up if you did not get to see the live show. It is definitely worth checking out. Um, and I would also uh, recommend checking out Sharknado 2 when that debuts pretty soon, because I'm sure that will be just as ridiculous. That comes out at the end of this month, I believe, on the Siffy channel, of course. Uh, the, Asy the Asylum and the Siffy channel, always a good combination. So, yep, I guess that's all I have to say about that. So, till next time, take care. And stay out of the water.